everyone! Welcome to the first lecture of chapter 7. Um, so I've broken apart the PowerPoint slides into three different lectures. So if you'll see this says chapter 7 part 1. Um, so those are the slides that we're going to cover um, during this particular uh, lecture. If you're following along um, on the main PowerPoint slides, this will be slides 1 through 31. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to go ahead and start chapter 7. Um, this is on quantum mechanics, um, and so it's on like the wave nature of light and things like that. If you take this, uh, this class in higher levels of chemistry, there's like, there's like a whole class devoted to quantum mechanics. You may have heard me talk about PCHEM or mention things about PCHEM. It's like the, um, overlap of physics and chemistry. So, uh, this slideshow and um, the rest of chapter seven will give you kind of a brief introduction um, to quantum mechanics. So we're not going very far into it. Um, a lot of quantum mechanics, you would need things like calc three um, and some quantum physics to go along with it. So like I said, we're just kind of going brief introduction into the wave nature of light uh, just to kind of get an introduction. So if I ever kind of sound vague or like I'm not going into too much depth, um, it's mostly intentional, um, just because we will fall down the rabbit hole really quickly. So there you are. So first thing we're going to do is talk a little bit about waves in general. Um, so light can behave as both a wave and a particle, which is why this whole field of quantum mechanics um, gets a little bit tricky. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how it behaves like a wave first. Um, so it travels as vibrations essentially in um, electrical and magnetic fields and it has some electric and magnetic properties to it. Um, and so this um, this picture here, so you may have seen um, waves and they kind of you know will look like this. You may have seen it depicted like that. Um, that is indicating the direction of propagation, right? So that is like the direction that the wave is going. Um, and so they will have two components, all waves. They will have an electric field and a magnetic field. And the electric field and the magnetic field are always completely perpendicular to each other. So like this angle here, this is 90 degrees. And so we can say like, you know, if the electric field is traveling, you know, on this, uh, what, this this x axis this x y axis right and then the <clears throat> the uh, magnetic field is traveling along this essentially x z axis right um, and then we're going to talk a lot about wavelength and so wavelength will be the distance between two crests um, and what I mean by crests is crests are the tops or the bottoms. So here they're showing, you know, the bottom. So the distance between the bottom of, of this wave and the bottom of this wave here. Um, but you could do the same thing from the top. It's going to be the same distance. And then wavelength is abbreviated by the Greek letter lambda. So that's this guy. Um, so if you keep seeing that little funny little upside down Y, um, that's the Greek letter lambda. It stands for wavelength. So light is energy. Um, and it's carried in this electromagnetic wave. And so we call them electromagnetic waves just because they have both electrical and magnetic properties. We're mostly just going to deal with the electrical properties in this class. Um, we'll let you get to the magnetic properties in higher, level of, uh, higher levels of physics. Um, but these waves are being emitted by vibrating electrons in the atoms. So you may have done like the flame test lab um, in maybe Chem 20 or, you know, Chem 10, if you've taken that before. Um, but essentially when, you know, when an atom absorbs energy, it, you know, can promote an electron to a higher energy level. And then when that energy is released, um, that release of energy is colored light, which is cool. Um, but so, so it's being produced by vibrating electrons. This magnetic field is what we call induced. Um, so the magnetic field is created from the electrical field. Um, and a magnetic field is induced in any region of space and when an electric field is changing with time. So since um, our electric field is going like this, right, and it's traveling, it's continually changing. So it's inducing a magnetic field 
um, that is exactly you know perpendicular to it, so at 90 degree angles. And the strength of this induced field is proportional to the rates of change on the inducing field. So if um, you know the electrical field you know changes is is increased then the magnetic field is also increased so it's directly proportional um, and light is an electromagnetic wave in the range of frequencies to which the eye is sensitive so um, there are other aspects of electromagnetic waves and we're going to go through what these are but what we think what we typically think of as light and specifically colored light um, are a certain set of wavelengths um, and it's actually a pretty narrow set of wavelengths um, but the electromagnetic spectrum has a very large range of wavelengths. So more on that in a little bit. Wave properties. So we have two different um, kind of things that we're going to talk about with respect to waves. One of them is frequency, and then one of them is wavelength. So wavelength, um, like I was talking about earlier, wavelength is the distance between two crests. So here in this top picture, um, the wavelength of A is the distance between, you know, two peaks of A, or you could say, you know, two troughs. That's what we call the stuff on the bottom, um, troughs. And if you look, um, the wavelength of B is much shorter. Um, those crests are all much closer together, um, and so it has a shorter wavelength. And then if we look down at C, the crests of C are even closer together, so C has an even shorter wavelength. So that's, that's how we're looking at um, wavelength. So this one up here would have the longest wavelength and this one um, down here would have the shortest wavelength. Um, and then we can we can compare them. Um, so frequency, frequency um, you'll see denoted by this um, V essentially. Sometimes you'll see it written as F as well. Um, it depends on what textbook you're looking at. Um, but frequency is cycles per second. Um, and so what this is, will essentially mean um, for us is like if we were to look at a given chunk of time, like because these waves are all essentially traveling, right? So if we assume they're all traveling to the right, we're going to look at how many waves happen in a certain amount of time. So let's say that this is our amount of time that we're looking at. Sorry, I didn't draw straight lines. Um, but let's say that that's the amount of time that we're looking at. If, if you'll see... Um, C letter C, if you see the bottom example, um, this has a much higher frequency, right? There are more cycles that are happening in this amount of time for C, and there are, you know, fewer cycle cycles that are happening up here. So we would say that C has a higher frequency because there are more cycles that are going to happen in a certain amount of time. Um, and so this has a lower frequency because there are fewer cycles that will happen in that amount of time. Um, so frequency and wavelength are what we called inversely proportional, right? These two guys, they are inversely um, proportional. And so we introduced proportional. So we introduced those terms um, when we were talking about gases, right? And so essentially what that means is if one thing goes up, the other thing goes down. So the longer the wavelength is, the shorter or lower the frequency. And then the shorter the wavelength is, the higher the frequency. So they are inversely proportional. When one goes up, the other goes down. Um, and the reason that we have this kind of relationship is they are all equal to C. And C, this is a constant. Um, C is the speed of light. And this is the <clears throat> the speed that all waves travel at, you know, when they're in a vacuum. Okay, so um, obviously, um, you know, our light isn't traveling in a vacuum, but it's it's going to travel at a at a similar kind of speed. But we're we're mostly going to assume that it's traveling at this speed of light. So frequency times wavelength will always equal c, and so this will allow us um, to calculate, you know, wavelength if we have frequency, or frequency if we have wavelength. So frequency, like I was talking about, measures how often something happens over a certain amount of time. So that's where we're looking at essentially how many you know, wavelengths happen in a certain amount of time. Um, and so we can measure how many times a pulse passes a fixed point over a given amount of time, and, and that would give us the frequency. Because we often can't you know, just like look at a wave and cut out a chunk like I just did. 
Um, instead, we would look at, you know, how many, how many times a pulse passes. That's how we would define it in physics. So here's an example. If we had a slinky, if I wiggled a slinky up and down, um, you can count how many waves, right? If you're moving it really fast, you can count how many um, waves pass this point in two seconds or whatever it is. Um, and so say that there were six waves that passed this point. Then we could say, you know, okay, six over two, right? Six waves um, per second. And so we would say, okay, then that is, you know, three waves per second. Um, or we can say cycles, as the case may be. Um, and so this actually, <laughs> instead of, we don't, we don't usually include this term cycles. That's kind of just inherent. Um, we call this three hertz. Um, and so hertz is cycles per second, but it's also more commonly used as one over seconds or seconds to the minus one. So all of these things um, mean the same thing. So whether you see hertz, cycles per second, one over second, or second to the minus one, they are all talking about frequency. Okay. Um, we will we will mostly give our answers in hertz. It's just helpful mathematically if you can remember that hertz is the same thing as one over seconds or seconds to the minus one. So another thing that we talk about with respect to waves is we talk about amplitude, which is the height of the wave. And we really don't deal with that very much in this class. I'll address it one other time in this particular lecture. Um, but in general, we don't really mess with amplitude. We'll leave that to the people in physics. Um, and the only thing that's really affecting is if you have a higher amplitude, right? If you have a taller wave, then that's going to mean a brighter light. And if you have a lower amplitude, that means a dimmer light. And so that's what that's what it's affecting here. We're not really caring about um, how bright or dim the light is. We are caring about the wavelength, right? Which is the distance between the, the crests or the troughs. Um, and then we care about the frequency, which is directly related to the wavelength. Amplitude is kind of its own thing that we're not going to really mess with. So here is how we're going to use this. So this here says calculate the wavelength in nanometers of infrared radiation that has a frequency of 9.76 times 10 to the 13 hertz. So remember that we have C is equal to 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Um, again, this is a constant. This will always be given to you. Um, you you'll likely, it's one of those that you'll likely memorize just because you're going to use it all the time, um, but it will be given to you. Um, and so we also have this equation, right? C is equal to lambda times frequency. So we are solving for wavelength, which is lambda. So lambda is going to equal C over V. So, okay. So we have wavelength, right? And we have 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And then our frequency. So again, frequency is in Hertz. Um, and mathematically that is one over seconds or seconds to the minus one. So, 9.76 times 10 to the 13. And I'm going to put one over seconds here. Just so you can see that the fact that there are seconds on the bottom, right? So meters per second and one over seconds. So when we calculate this, those two sets of seconds will cancel out. And we're just going to end up with meters. Um, so this comes out to 3.07 times 10 to the minus 6 meters which would be all well and fine if I had asked for the answer in meters, but instead I've asked for the meter, the answer in nanometers. Um, and this is really common when we're talking about light. A lot of times we will give the answer in nanometers instead of meters, um, just because it's easier to talk about smaller numbers, no scientific notation, things like that. Um, so we can put, you know, 3.07 times 10 to the minus six meters. Um, and our conversion here is that there are, for every one meter, there is one times 10 to the ninth nanometers. Um, you may also have remembered this as like uh, one times 10 to the minus ninth meters is equal to one nanometer. Either one of those is fine. It's going to come out the same. Um, just when you're, when you're punching this into your calculator, make sure that you're doing it correctly. Other Otherwise, your exponent on your answer is going to come out one off. I see that all the time. 
Um, so just be careful how you're pl plugging this in. If you're using the double E button that I've talked about before, put this in your calculator as one E nine or one E minus nine, depending on which of these conversions you're using. Um, but that, that would be the easiest way. Okay, so back to this. So 3.07 times 10 to the minus six meters. Um, and then we can convert that to nanometers. So our answer will be this. So that's how you use that equation. Um, again, most people can figure out the equation just fine. It's sometimes the conversion to nanometers gets a little bit weird. So make sure you know that conversion. That one will be really, really important uh, in this particular chapter. So this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, the thing I was talking about earlier, right? This is the um, all of the electromagnetic waves of varying wavelength. Um, so here, this visible light, the light that we normally think about, right? Colored light, um, as you can see, takes up a very, very small um, area of um, the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, if you... Um, I have, did not learn this in elementary school. Um, you need to remember the colors of the rainbow. Um, and so the way that we remember the colors of the rainbow is Roy G. Biv. Honestly, if you didn't learn that, write it down. Um, so these are the colors of the rainbow, right? We have R is red, O is orange, Y is yellow, G is green, B is blue, I is indigo, and V is violet. And these tell you the colors um, of the rainbow in their order. Um, and so Red will have the longest wavelength, um, and then violet has a short wavelength. Um, I'm not going to ask you for, like, um, you know, it, knowing that red is 750 nanometers or things like that, but I would expect you to be able to compare the energy of two different colors. So, like, knowing that orange has a longer wavelength than blue because of Roy G. Biv, right? So, you do need to know that. Um, so the electromagnetic spectrum up here, um, up at the top, just is showing um, how long these wavelengths are in respect to everything else. So like, and we're going to go through all of these. Radio frequencies are have very, very long wavelengths. Um, and that's how you can get radio frequency, you know, in places like um, the desert or the mountains, or if you're driving across country and, you know, you don't have cell reception, but you may have radio frequency because those wavelengths are so long that they're able to go around mountains and um, over valleys and things like that, which is really, really cool. Um, and then off to the other end of the spectrum, we have gamma rays, which have extremely short wavelengths. Um, and so, so this is, I would ask, ask you to know just kind of the general order of this. Radio frequency, microwave, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma rays. I usually remember it kind of the opposite of, of how it's shown on here. I remember it long to short. You can remember it short to long, whatever makes you happy. Um, but essentially, um, you need to know this order. So we're going to go through each one um, and just kind of talk about them. So radio waves. Radio waves are the longest electromagnetic waves. They can be um, about a mile long, which is really, really cool. Um, so that's why I was saying that they can go, um, oh, sorry, the wavelength <laughs> can be about a mile long, um, which is why they can go around mountains and over things, um, especially like AM radio waves, if you'll look um, down at the bottom, AM radio waves are super long, which is why you'll get AD AM radio waves a lot of places, um, and then, you know, you'll get FM radio waves other places in addition to the AM radio waves, right? The longer the wavelength, the more reception, essentially, you're going to have, um, which is really neat. Um, so here's some just uses, uh, like TV broadcasting, obviously the radio, um, heart rate monitors, cell phone communications, MRIs. Um, so it's, it's pretty cool. But these are the longest ones. Um, and then microwaves. Microwaves, you should be familiar with from your microwave, right? And so microwaves have a wavelength from one millimeter to about a meter. Um, so the most obvious use, like I said, is a microwave oven. Um, you also use these in your Bluetooth headsets, um, your internet, radar, GPS, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I want to stress, um, just, you know, from a kind of funny standpoint, 
Um, if you've ever heard like your parents say, oh, don't stand too close to the microwave, you're going to get cancer, right? Um, that is not true. Not true. You can stand as close to the microwave as you want and you're never going to get cancer um, because the wavelengths are not short enough to mutate your cells. And so we'll talk about uh, once we get there, but microwaves can't give you cancer. They can just heat up your food. So stand as close as you want to the microwave and stare at it. You are totally fine. Um, the way that the microwave actually works, um, microwaves themselves are not producing any heat. Microwaves are going in and they are um, vibrating your molecules of water. Microwaves are specifically tuned, like not, so this is, this is really, this is really general, right? Um, and so what I'm talking about right now is like your microwave oven. Um, but those microwaves are tuned to the specific frequency of water. And so they will um, send out this um, wavelength and it will vibrate your water molecules. And when it vibrates your water molecules, it causes your water molecules to release energy. And that release of energy is actually what heats up your food. So the microwave themselves, they're not producing heat. Um, and like theoretically, if you put something, let's say a plate, if you put a completely dry plate in the microwave and just turn the microwave on, and it was completely dry, like you'd baked it in the oven before or something, completely dry, um, and you turn the microwave on, the plate would not heat up because there's no water there. The only way that your food heats up is because it has little water molecules in it and the microwave is vibrating those water molecules which in turn release energy to your food and heat it up which is actually really really cool so there you go that's microwaves infrared radiation um you are likely familiar with this if you are or if you've played like a Call of Duty or something like that, right? These night vision goggles. Infrared radiation is what we think of as like heat radiation. Like all of you sitting right there listening to this are giving off infrared radiation because your body heat, right, is leaving you. Um, so you're giving off infrared radiation. So infrared radiation is the any wavelength that is between microwaves and visible lights. So this is used, like I said, for, you know, night vision goggles. Um, that would be, you know, you, you can see the heat coming off of people. Um, this is also what your remote controls use to control your television. Um, and then if you have a, you know, heat seeking missile, again, infrared radiation, you can think of as being like heat, essentially. Visible light um, is the only type of electromagnetic radiation, right? So that's what EM is. Um, able to be detected by the human eye. We can see the colors of the rainbow and nothing else. Um, like I was talking about before, violet is the highest frequency of light, and then red light is the lowest frequency of light. So if, it's the, if violet is the highest frequency of light, that means it has the shortest wavelength. And red light is the lowest frequency of light, and it is the longest wavelength. Um, and again, we'll remember Roy G. Biv so that we can remember the colors of the order of the rainbow. And then you just don't need to remember that, you know, red light is the long wavelength side um, and then violet is the short wavelength side and everything else you can get from there. Ultraviolet, um, UV light, right? These are wavelengths that are shorter than visible light. So we're getting shorter and shorter and shorter here. So I wanna point out like one of the things that we know about UV light um, is, you know, you wear, like when people think of UV light, they'll think of two things. They'll either think of black lights, right? Um, like if you went to roller town and you know, there's a black light. Um, but they'll also think of the sun, right? The sun is probably, um, the most common thing people think of when they think of UV light. Um, and so one of the things when we think about the sun and UV light, the thing that comes to mind is that, you know, you need to wear sunscreen and and we all know this because you don't want to get skin cancer right um and so the sunscreen prevents or helps to prevent the sun and the uv light from the sun from going in and mutating your cells and these mutated cells are what's giving you cancer um, and so this is the the first wavelength of light that is actually short enough to mutate your cells okay so as soon as we get below visible light 
um, we start getting into the region where, you know, things can cause damage. So this is why I was saying before, like the microwaves, microwaves are totally fine. Their wavelengths are too long. They cannot mutate your cells. Ultraviolet light though has a very short wavelength and it can go in, mutate your cells. And then your, your, your other cells recognize that as not being, um, normal and they'll go and like try and kill it and things like that. I'm more on that if you take a, a medical class. Um, but UV lights, whoops, UV lights are harmful to living things. So that's why it's very important to wear sunscreen, especially if you have red hair and very pale skin like me. Um, it's also used to sterilize medical equipment because it can go in and kill, you know, antimicrobial or mi microbial things and things like that. Um, too much of it, like we said, can cause a sunburn. And if you have too much, then it can cause skin cancer because again, it's mutating those cells, but it's because it has such a short wavelength. X-rays, um, X-rays are, have a very tiny wavelength, which I know is a really scientific term, right? Um, but these are, are short wavelengths and they are high energy waves and we use them, um, in medical imaging, right? You, you've gone to the dentist or the doctor and gotten an X-ray. Um, and they also use them in airport security. Um, but so if you'll, if you'll think about, you know, when you get X-rays, like if you went to the dentist, right, you go to the dentist and they're like, Hey, we're going to x-ray your teeth. And you're like, cool. Um, so what they do is they put, you know, they put the things in your mouth and, and, and whatever, but they put a lead vest on you. And they put a lead vest on you, um, to protect, um, all of your vital organs, right? Because they don't want to x-ray more things than are necessary. Because again, these are very small wavelengths. So since these wavelengths are so small, they have the ability to mutate your cells. Um, so you don't want to just keep getting x-rays um, because then if you keep getting x-rays, you're having higher and higher doses um, of this radiation and it can actually go in and give you cancer. Um, so this is like, um, if you know anything about, you know, Marie Curie, and I'll put her name here. Uh, Marie Curie um, was one of the first person to work with x-rays. She is actually really cool. Um, she has two different Nobel Prizes. She has one in physics and one in chemistry. Um, and her husband actually uh, shares the one in physics. So we always joke that, you know, he's her loser husband. He only has one Nobel Prize and she has two. Um, but Marie Curie, um, a lot of times when you hear about x-rays, you'll think of her um, because she actually worked with x-rays and, and died of um, essentially over x-raying her hand, um, excessive radiation. So you don't want to get too many x-rays. Obviously, um, some is good, right? If you can see that, you know, you have cavities or your bones are broken, um, but it's very important to use caution. Like if you think about, uh, your dental hygienist, like she'll put the, uh, right, the, um, lead vest on you and then she will leave while you get the x-ray done because they have to minimize their exposure, um, to these x-rays. So they actually most times will wear radiation counters so they can keep track of how much radiation they've actually been exposed to over time. So really, really interesting. Gamma rays um, are our smallest type of radiation. Um, and so they are, um, and we associate small wavelengths with high frequency and high frequency we're going to correlate um, with high energy. So I'm gonna write all that up here because we're gonna talk about this more. So if something has a small wavelength, that means they have a very high frequency um, which means that they are very high energy. So like radio waves we talked about before, they have very long wavelengths, which means they have very low frequencies, which means they are very low energy, right? Nobody, you've never heard anyone getting, you know, hurt by the radio waves. Um, but gamma rays have really small wavelengths. They are very high in energy. Um, and so we use them, we can use them to sterilize medical equipment, but we'll also use them um, predominantly in cancer treatment. Um, and so this should strike you as like, whoa, hang on. You just told me things with really small wavelengths can cause cancer, right? And now you're telling me that it's used to treat cancer. So that should strike you as, as strange. Um, and the reason is that gamma rays pretty much kill all cells, the end. Doesn't matter if they're good cells or bad cells or what they are. So if you've heard of people going through like chemo and radiation, the radiation part of it is these gamma rays. Um, and so they'll get really targeted radiation on the cancer cells themselves, and then it will, it will kill those cells. 
which is cool. Um, obviously, you have to make sure it's really, really targeted so that you're not killing healthy cells along with it because it's just going to kill everything in its path. Um, and I do want to point out, just as like a funny thing, whenever I talk about gamma rays, there's inevitably someone who's like, ah, gamma rays equal the Hulk, right? From the Marvel movies. If you get hit with enough gamma rays, you will turn into the Hulk. No, you do not get turned into the Hulk. If you get hit with enough gamma rays, you will die. It kills nearly all living cells. So don't, uh, don't try to turn into the Hulk that way. Um, so like we've talked about before, um, electromagnetic radi radiation has an associated energy. And this is kind of what I was talking about on the last slide, um, that if we think about moving along the spectrum from really long wavelengths to really short wavelengths, the energy increases as the wavelength shortens. So that's what I wrote on the top last time. If we have, you know, a short wavelength, again, we're going to have a high frequency, which means this is going to be a very high energy. So in looking at this picture below, right, this, this one has a short wavelength, which means it has a high frequency, which means it is corresponding to more energy. This one has a very, um, oops, sorry, long wavelength, and it has a, a low frequency, Ooh, there we go. And then, so that means it has less energy. So um, the wavelength and the frequency are inversely proportional. One goes up, one goes down. But frequency and energy are directly proportional. So if we have a high frequency, we have high energy. If we have a low frequency, then we have a low energy. So that's how that's all related. Um, so this is just showing it in terms of a jump rope, right? If you consider this jump rope, ends being pulled up and down to make this one, right? To make this wavelength, you needed to input a lot of energy. You need to move your arms really, really fast um, to make it, the jump rope look like that. Whereas this one down on the bottom, you need to move your arms less, so less energy. Um, that's just if you're trying to remember, you know, if you need a way to remember all this. Otherwise, like I said, if you just remember this thing up at the top, short wavelengths give you high frequency, which give you high energy, and then the reverse is also true. So here's a summary. All electromagnetic waves are traveling at the same speed. They are all traveling at the speed of light in a vacuum. Um, obviously, they're going to travel at slightly different speeds when they're not in a vacuum, but we're just going to say pretty much um, they're going to travel at this. We're not going to deal with air resistance and other things like that. They all, though, have different wavelengths, right? And so those are the things we were just talking about, like radio waves and microwaves and visible light and all that good stuff. They all have different wavelengths. And so therefore they have different frequencies. So if they have a long wavelength, they have a low frequency. If they have a short wavelength, they have a high frequency. And again, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. Um, so these are um, what you need to know. So they all have different wavelengths, different frequencies, but they are all traveling at the speed of light, right? And so, and then remember we have this equation that C is equal to lambda times V or the speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency. Um, so that's a little bit just on the wave nature of light. Still more though, still more to go. <laughs> um, so our next topic is talking about how waves move, essentially. Um, and so this would be like if I dropped, um, I don't know, a pebble into um, a lake. And so it would it would send out these ripples, right? And they would go, you know, rippling out. Um, and we can think about the waves, or see, these rays um, coming directly out, and they're always going to be perpendicular to the wave fronts, which is, which is this thing here. We call it the wave front. Um, and the wave fronts are always going to be expanding from the point source, which is here. That just means from where it starts. Um, and light waves travel just like any other waves. So just like if I dropped... Um, a pebble in a pond, light waves are going to travel just the same as those waves that we think of like in the water. Um, and we can characterize their movements by looking at the crest. So we're always going to look at the tops of the waves. Um, and these lines, like I said, that were perpendicular to the motion of the wave indicate the location of the crests in the waves that are traveling together. And so we're, again, we're going to look at the crests um, and we're going to look at how these waves travel. Um, so this is diffraction. 
So here's some waves. So these over here, these are like the wave fronts, right? And the waves are kind of traveling along until they hit this ball. And when they hit this ball, now it produces this pattern where they are traveling around the ball, essentially. Um, and so this is called, this is the bending, right? So diffraction is the bending of a wave around an obstacle like this ball or edges of an opening by means other than reflection or refraction. So we're not gonna cover these um, types of movement. So reflection would be like, um, you know, if you had a mirror, right? And so your light would travel and hit the mirror and bounce back. And then refraction is the bending of light. Like if you were to look at light as it goes from um, air into water, that's, it's gonna, it's gonna bend. Um, so this is, this is kind of related to this, but, but different. So we're not looking, we're not looking at reflection, the bouncing or refraction, which is the bending of going from one thing to another. Um, this is a different, this is in different mediums. Um, we are looking at what happens when light hits an obstacle or the edges of an opening. Um, so we're going to talk about this term diffraction. So again, diffraction, traveling waves, bending around, obstacles are opening. So if these, this was our wave, right? These straight lines, um, and they're going, they're traveling along, and then they hit this um, opening here. And now when they hit this opening, they bend when they go through it just on the how the wave works. You could do this with water even if you wanted to, but when it hits this opening, um, it's going to bend and go through it um, in these like curved patterns like this. So this is called diffraction. Um, whereas if it was a particle, right? Say that these were, I don't know, bouncy balls and you have, you know, you have these bouncy balls that are traveling. If this one hits here, it would, you know, bounce back. This one hits, it would bounce back. And these ones would just go straight through. Bouncy balls aren't going to diffract and do this whole bending thing, they're just gonna go straight through. So um, these are just two different ways that things behave. This is how waves behave, this is how particles behave. Um, so when waves diffract, um, sometimes we will have an instance where two wave crests or two wave troughs will meet. Um, so this is where, so this is when two waves are meeting, okay? Um, and they are while traveling along the same medium. So that would be like, you know, two waves in the water. Um, and this is called interference. So if you say you went to the beach and you were, I don't know, boogie boarding and you're waiting for a wave and you see this, you know, little wave coming towards you, um, but you see behind it, another wave is coming um, and it's bigger wave and it's going to kind of hit you at the same time the smaller wave does. And so what happens is that when those hit you at the same time, their height kind of gets added, right? Then it would make a really big wave, right? Which is, which is awesome um, if you're boogie boarding or surfing or whatever it is, but they're, they're added. It. That would be constructive interference where this crest and this crest are happening at the same time. So they get added together to make a really big wave. Similarly, this trough and this trough are happening at the same time, so they make an even deeper trough, right? So this, this is additive. This is constructive interference. The waves are getting added together because they are happening um, what we call in phase, in phase. Um, these ones are called destructive interference. So here, this crest is happening at the same time as this trough. Um, and this trough is happening at the same time as this crest. So they will essentially cancel out, right? And so when they cancel out like this, um, then we're just getting this straight line. So this is when our waves are out of phase. Okay, so that would be destructive interference. So this is how, so this is like the two options for when waves meet. They can either be constructive and they'll get added together or they'll be destructive and they'll kind of cancel out. Um, so it's waves that waves uh, meet. So this is called, they can create an interference pattern. So this is um, a, what we call a double slit experiment. So there's you know one slit happening here and one slit happening here. And so if the waves are leaving these, uh, you know, leaving this and hitting these two slits at the same time, then they leave the two slits at the same time, we get this interference pattern. Oop. Oh, hang on, let me let it play through. So here we go. So then they're gonna hit there and they're gonna travel outward like that. 
and we'll see that the waves are starting to overlap, right? And so if we look at where the waves overlap, so um, traveling along each one of these uh, dotted lines is where the waves are meeting. And same thing that they don't have it, but through the middle here. Those would be the, the locations of constructive interference. Um, and they'll make this pattern, um, which is really, really cool. And you can set up kind of a detector here and look at these spots of light that are happening um, when these waves interact. And so this is, this is called an interference pattern. Okay. So let's figure out um, a little bit. I want you to figure out where are the places um, that will have constructive interference and then where are the places that will have destructive interference. So where are the places where the waves are getting added together and where are the waves getting, you know, canceling out? So um, go ahead and pause right here. Try this out. See if you can identify where they're getting added together, where, you know, their heights are working together or where they're working against each other. So go ahead and pause. All right. So here's the answers. So we have constructive interference at G, J, M, and N. So let's look at those. So G, right, here's G. Because both of them are kind of going up, right, these would be constructive interference. Same thing here for J, they're both going in the same direction. That would be constructive interference. Either though, Even though they're going down, they're in a trough, they're both going in the same direction. Same thing here with M and with N, right? The waves are going in the same direction, so that would be constructive interference. Destructive interference is where they're going to be going in opposite directions. Even if they don't cancel out um, exactly, right, they're going to be some cancellation of the wave. So here we've got one above and below, right, a crest and a trough. Um, and same thing with I, right, we've got a crest and a trough. And K and L and O, right? So these would be being added. Um, and these would be, you could think of being subtracted. All right, constructive and destructive interference. So um, going back and talking about um, this diffraction pattern, going through the double slits. So this was called Young's double slit experiment. Um, so if you wanna, whoop, if you wanna look it up, um, it's actually really, really interesting. Um, so like, like we were saying before, you know, here's a bunch of light. It's coming through these two slits and they were, um, you know, seeing, you know, they put a screen down here to collect their, their data and they were seeing these patterns. So they were seeing um, dark spots and light spots. So the light spots were from constructive interference where the light was being added together. Um, and the dark spots like that, you know, like, like this, these dark spots, this was destructive interference. Right? And so this is where the light was canceling out. And so, like I said, these bright, the bright spots would be constructive interference. Um, and so this is, this is the Young's double slit experiment. And it essentially proved that light behaves as a wave, right? This was, this was a laser that was sent through here. And if we think of lasers, we think of them as being um, just like a, a point of light, essentially, which is a very bright kind of narrow light. And so they sent this laser through these two very narrow slits and they got an interference pattern. Um, and the only way that they would get an interference pattern, the only way you get an interference pattern is if something is behaving as a wave. Um, so this, this proved light behaves as a wave. If light was behaving as a particle, like we were talking about before, then the light would just go straight through. Um, straight through these slits and it wouldn't diffract. It wouldn't do anything. Essentially what we would see is we would see a bright spot here and a bright spot here and everything else would be dark, but that's not what we see when we see, uh, what we see is when we send a laser through these double slits, we're seeing this interference pattern, which proves that light is behaving as a wave, not as a particle, um, in this particular instance. Again, like I said at the very beginning, light can behave both as a wave and a particle, 
Um, so there's more, there's more to this. But this does prove, though, that light at least behaves sometimes as a wave. So this is, this is I think, I think this is really cool. <laughs> so here it is again. Um, those like bright spots, those were constructive interference. These are waves um, arriving at the screen in phase, which means that they're, you know, the crests were meeting. And then the dark fringes were destructive interference, where waves were arriving, uh, were arriving at the screen out of phase. That means like um, one was being, let's see if I can draw this, one was being a crest while the other was being a trough, right? And so it would be like, like this point. I don't know if that makes any sense, but hopefully it does. Um, but but they're they're canceling out. The waves were canceling out. Um, so they had dark dark spots, and then they had light spots. Um, but yeah, so this this like I said, it proved that light can travel as a wave. It's really really neat. Um, I would recommend. I've posted this video. I'm not going to play it during here. You can go watch it. Um, but it talks more about the double slit experiment and how. Um, electrons will behave sometimes as a particle and as a wave. I would, I would really recommend, I would watch this. It's so cool. Um, it goes more into depth in this whole thing. And it talks about um, how if you are looking, right? If we try and observe individual particles, it can actually influence how light behaves. And it can cause light to behave as a particle sometimes, and then if you stop looking at it, light might go back to behaving as a wave and things like that. It's really, really interesting. Um, so you, I would recommend watching this. Um, and just to, you know, kind of emphasize that there may be questions on upcoming exams regarding what he says in here. And it's, it's not covered in what I've talked about so far. It's what happens when an individual electron travels um, through these double slits. Super interesting, so go watch it later. Um, it's not very long, I think it's like five, 10 minutes. Um, and like I said, I think you'll find it really interesting. So our last topic for today um, is the photoelectric effect. Um, and the photoelectric effect um, comes from this, this classical um, electrical uh, magnetic theory. Um, and it states that an electron will break free um, from a metal once it absorbs enough energy. Um, and this, this is from light of any color, any frequency. So if you just, you know, say you have a piece of metal and, um, you just hit it with some, some light, doesn't matter what light, but you're just going to hit it with some light. Eventually what the thought was is that eventually one of these electrons would come off once it absorbs enough energy. Um, and so it says that there was a lag time before the electrons were emitted. And essentially what was happening is they were kind of cycling through, um, colors of light. Um, so just to explain um, the picture over there on the left, so it has incoming light and it's hitting this light sensitive metal plate. And it said once um, this light gave the plate enough energy, it would kick off an electron. Um, and that electron would be kicked off and would be attracted to this, this positive electrode here, right? Because positives and negatives attract. And so once it hits that positive electrode, we could measure, um, you know, the current that it's it's being, you know, that's that's being released from that electron because current is just moving electrons. Um, so the thought was that, you know, okay, here's this light coming in, right, and and eventually it would hit this metal, and once there was enough energy, it would kick off this electrons. But the predictions were wrong, okay. And so I really want to emphasize this. So this was. Um, this thought was like once it absorbed enough energy, uh, which isn't true. Um, so this, this is not what is actually happening. Okay. But this was like the initial thought. Once it gets enough energy, it can kick off an electron. Um, but that's not, that's not what happened. Um, so what they saw was that if these photoelectrons get ejected when you shine monochromatic light, so this is, this is just one, right? One color essentially of light on the target, that current Will increase when you increase the intensity. So um, essentially brighter light meant more electrons were being released, which meant higher current, more electricity. Um, and so this term, this photoelectrons, oh, missing some stuff here, but <laughs> the, um, the photoelectrons are just what we call these electrons that are being kicked off. Um, but um, it didn't work 
above and below these like cut off wavelengths. So it said, okay, this, this experiment works, but it only works in the range of this wavelength, you know, of wavelength one to wavelength two. It doesn't work above or below that. Over here, we have no electrons being released, and up here, we have no electrons being released. But so as long as you just play in this, you know, range of, of wavelengths, then it works. Um, and hopefully you guys have seen or talked about enough chemistry that if something only works in a certain range or for a certain amount of time, then maybe that's not really why it's working, right? And so that was, that was kind of what led to this. So above or below these wavelengths, no photoelectrons are getting ejected, no matter how great the intensity of the radiation. So no matter how bright this light was and for how long they left it on this metal, no electrons were getting um, absorbed or, or we're getting released. So that means then thinking about this other slide, right? That means whoop, um, that means that, it, that, that this whole, it's based on the energy thing can't possibly be true because otherwise, if we just left the light on, eventually it should absorb enough energy to kick off an electron. But that's not what we saw happen, right? It essentially, it doesn't matter how long you leave the light on, if it's below this wavelength one or above this wavelength two, then no electrons will ever get released. So that must not be why, right? It must not be based on the energy. So they realized that light shined on it had a frequency requirement, which we know is directly related to the wavelength, right? So you know, if it had, you know, a certain wavelength, it can have a certain frequency. So it was based on the frequency or the wavelength, not the amplitude, right? And so the amplitude means how bright the light was. Um, so it's not related to the amplitude um, and it's not um, related to the energy. It is instead related to the frequency and the wavelength. Um, so once they have sorted this whole thing out, now there's no time lag, which is great. So as long as you put the right wavelength of light or the right frequency of light, then the electrons come flying off of that piece of metal. So they realized light depends, um, or this light energy depends on frequency, not amplitude, okay? So the energy of the light depends on frequency, not amplitude. So it doesn't matter how bright the light is, right? Um, instead, it matters what the frequency of light is, the wavelength of light is. So a couple conclusions from the photoelectric effect. They determined that this light energy comes in packets, right? So if we, if we hit the metal with enough energy packet, then we can kick off an electron. Um, and so we call these packets photons or quantums. Um, this is kind of less common, but that's why we call this quantum mechanics is it's because dealing with light. Um, and light packets, um, we will typically call them photons. And each packet acts more like a particle than a wave. So you can think of um, photons as, so this is, this is a photon over here, essentially is how we're going to talk about it. It is a packet of light waves. <laughs> um, so if it's a high energy photon, then it's got lots of little tiny short wavelength waves in that packet. And then if it's a low energy photon, then it has longer wavelengths of light, but still in that light packet. So this is kind of how we're thinking about the difference between um, it acting as a particle and it acting as a wave. So when light is acting as a particle, like it does in the photoelectric effect, um, then it's traveling as these little light wave packets, which we call photons. Um, so each packet over here acts more like a particle than it does a wave. Um, and so rather than continuously absorbing this wave radiation, the target, it's like being hit with um, a bunch of little photons, like tiny little billiard balls, right? So it's being hit with tons of little light packets. And once it gets hit with enough light packets, then um, it can kick off an electron. So here we have another equation here. So like it said in the last slide, the um, photoelectric effect proved that energy, right, capital E energy is based on frequency, not on amplitude, 
Um, so it doesn't matter how bright or dim your light is, instead it's related to frequency. So if we have a higher frequency of light, then we have a higher energy of light. If we have a lower frequency of light, then we have a lower energy of light. Again, nothing to do whatsoever with, um, with, with amplitude. So we have a new constant here. Um, so we have H. So H is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th joule seconds. Um, so these are multiplied together. Sometimes you'll see them written like this. So joule seconds. Um, H is Planck's constant, which is, um, which is cool. That's how you pronounce it, Planck. Um, and he essentially came up with this constant to make the math work, which is awesome. But don't think that that means you can go around creating your own constants to make your math work. Um, but that is one of the ways that he came up with this one, which is, which is kind of interesting. So essentially, um, to kind of sum up today's work, a particle can be both, or sorry, light can be both a particle and a wave. So if we think about a flashlight, in a flashlight we have this light beam that's traveling out of it. Um, and so the way that we are going to think about light is we are going to think about little packets of light waves. So we're going to think about it as traveling photons, right? Each one of these is called a photon. And photons are packets of light waves. And we'll think about how short or long those wavelengths are in the little light packets. So light travels like a shower of particles, and each particle has its own um, energy, which again is associated with the wavelength and the frequency. So there you go. That is the end of part one of chapter seven. Welcome to quantum mechanics.